And so JB, are you ready? He was born again ready. Come on up here. And like I was beginning to say when I was so greatly interrupted by Doug Neese, praise God, appreciate you doing that. But, uh, you know, most people honor JB and Tony for all the things that they've accomplished in the natural realm. And I acknowledge that. But, you know, it's their relationship with the Lord. These guys are spiritual giants. They really are. I mean, they are a blessing. And I wish you could see what's going on behind the scenes. I was talking to some of our ladies that have been helping us back here in the green room this morning. And they were saying, JB and Tony are just the most kind, gentle people. They honor them. We've got uh, Ryan down here, Lieutenant Ryan, and JB's always honoring him. And we have people come in that aren't near as well known as JB and Tony. And they just treat our staff like they are here to serve them. And, and these men honor other people. They love the Lord. They're humble. And I tell you, I just love you, brother. I, I you appreciate too, God putting thank us you. together. Thank you so, much, so thank you so much. Give us heaven, brother. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I pray that you guys have had a wonderful and a restful evening. But more importantly, has the conference been fulfilling to you guys? Have questions and things been broken? Now, I know this is a little out of the ordinary. And again, Andrew actually does TV better than me. Uh, Lieutenant Ryan has been praying, telling me just to keep myself out of it and totally lean on the Holy Spirit, which I'm doing now because I'm not quite sure where he's going to head me, head me. Uh, Andrew, I think on Friday night, was starting to get into Philippians 3 and never got there, but he's got everything written on the tablet of his heart. He just followed the Lord. So I'm making the effort to do that as well today. But I know last year when I was working with Andrew, we had to do a television commercial or promo, I think for a Facebook Live airing. And so Andrew said, let's give him two minutes and 30 seconds. And in TV, I'm accustomed to getting every detail so I'll know where we're heading. And I said, Andrew, what are we going to talk about? He said, we're to talk about the Lord. I said, well, how long is it going to be? He says, we're just going to go for two minutes and 30 seconds. I said, how are you going to lead to me? He, are you in TV or what? Can you just flow with the spirit? So he does it far better than I do. This is a little different if I'm following the Holy Spirit properly, and I think so. I know that we have a number of men here who are saved, who know the Lord and have come here to be strengthened in their faith. And that's what we all need to do. Certainly coming from the world of sports, in terms of having played it about 80 pounds ago and 200 years ago, and, and even with what we do now, because it does apply in the game of life, we know that faith cometh by Hearing. and, Hearing. and Hearing. the Word of God. So that's what I'm making the effort to do here. But I also know that there are some maybe who have kind of, you know, stood on some shaky ground in terms of whether or not they strongly believe and maybe having to be strengthened. And some who don't really know the Lord and have come here to see if he is who we say he is, who the book says he is. If in fact I can ask, because this is only out of a heart of love, can I see a show of hands of any men who still want to be convinced that God is who he says he is and they want to welcome him into their heart? Are there any men here who will be bold enough to say that so that we can love on you as well too? Anybody? Well, hallelujah for a saved congregation and praise God. That's good to know. Well then before we get started, is, uh, is Trey Hepson here? Trey, Trey, can you come up and say a prayer for me, please, too? Uh, Andrew, you know I talk about you all the time, so can you come on up? Yeah. Trey's testimony, and I'm not going to share his testimony. Those who know him from Karis Bible College know he has an awesome testimony. Paul Milligan and I were talking about how he has a Joe Cocker singing voice that he's taken 10 times better than that because he knows the Lord. So, Trey, would you open us up, and however the Lord is leading you to pray for today's conference, would you please, sir? Father, I just thank you for this gathering. Thank you that we are able to gather together to glorify you as one body. Father, I just speak unity over all these strong men. Father, right now, may your blessings of prosperity and joy and peace resonate within this congregation. Lord, I thank you for the leadership here. I thank you for the speakers, God. I thank you that they are such strong men with hearts after you, Lord. Just strengthen us in our walk, Lord. Give us more discernment of your will, your perfect will, and give us your strength that we are able to walk strongly forward as men together, as the body of Christ with you as the head, Jesus. We just thank you right now that you never leave us or forsake us and that every promise is yes and amen. 
in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name amen. we pray. Amen and amen. You, love you, sir. Love you, too. Okay. See you yes, sir. You sure will. Okay. Thank you so much, Trey. Hey, so in the effort of reinforcing the Bible, the epistle, the love letter that God has sent to us and given to us, if there are any who maybe were a little shy about raising their hand to understand whether or not God is who he says he is. Before I get into the message, I believe I'm being led to just speak on this, just to underscore again how the Bible is the inerrant word of God. It is absolutely what it says it is. Out in the world, and Andrew and Paul and, and uh, Pastor Parr and all the good folks here have just underscored that the platform we have in the secular world is in fact our ministry field. And it is a challenge because we get bombarded with so much on a daily basis, which is why my wife, when she dragged me to Andrew Womack's program, and now it is the first thing we see when we wake up in the morning after quiet time with the Lord first seeking him early to get filled with his word and listening to what his directive, his priorities are for the day so that we can meet whatever the challenges are that come because his word will guide us. And the Bible is the inerrant word of God. There is enough hard evidence in the Bible to substantiate the fact that it is true. It is a supernatural book above the natural, so therefore you would expect there to be supernatural things in the Bible. But we need to know it and to believe it and to be obedient to it. And there is enough hard evidence for those people who want signs, people who want evidence that the Bible is what it says it is. There's enough hard evidence to point directly to the supernatural nature of the Bible. You heard me mention yesterday in Numbers 23 and 19, if we're going to base our lives on the word of God, who is he? And I dealt with that yesterday with the I am message. God says that he is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He's offering us eternal life. Life is eternal one way or the other. And in Titus 1 and 2, it says in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. So we are basing our lives on the character and integrity of God himself who cannot lie. The Bible is, and I'll only give two points before getting into the message. The Bible is historically accurate. There's so many people out there who want to doubt the Bible, even so-called intellectual giants who want to dig into the word of God and point out what they consider to be contradictions and inaccuracies. Just like in the game of football, you can't understand the game of football unless you understand the language of football. When you hear the quarterback call a play using all of this language that's esoteric, unique to football, you need to understand the language. Well, it's the same thing for those carnal-minded folks out there who try to interpret the Bible with a carnal mind. But for those who did try to do that, in the book of Luke, and in the book of Acts, he gets his facts correct. As a matter of fact, the well-known Christian apologist, Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Christ, he went and examined every one of the 32 countries and the 52 cities and the nine islands that he mentions, that Luke mentions in his gospel. And there was not one mistake. The Bible gets it correct. Fulfilled prophecy is another distinctive characteristic of the Bible. There are so many other religions that will claim that they are the way, but only the Bible has specific predictive prophecies that talk accurately about what is going to happen before it does. In all the other religions, there may be one general prophecy that they've gone back to revise when they've gotten it incorrectly, but the Bible in the Old Testament, there are over 2,000 specific predictive prophecies. And don't you know the world, if one of those things went wrong, were wrong, the world would pull the rug from up under the Bible, but the Bible gets it correct. And in the Old Testament, these things are talked about hundreds and thousands of years before they happened with specific accuracy. 
in the Old Testament alone, as I mentioned, over 2,000 specific predictive prophecies that happened. I love it because in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24, it talks about the exact time that Jesus Christ was going to appear, the exact time, and that's what happened. In the book of Micah, chapter five and verse two, it talks about Jesus who was gonna grow up in the small village of Bethlehem. I also love Zechariah chapter nine and verse nine. Zechariah 11, 12 and 13, where it was prophesied that Jesus would come riding into Jerusalem on the back of a coat, but later be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver specific predictive prophecy that absolutely happened. And in Isaiah 53 and nine, it describes how Jesus will be put to death in between two criminals. The Bible gets it correct. There is no other faith that does that. And nothing has not happened that God says it was and that which is yet to happen. We have the basis of what has occurred. When you go for a job interview and that boss looks at the resume, he or she is going to determine whether or not you get the opportunity based on what you have done. Look at what God has done for us. So what else is there to question about whether or not he is who he says he is and what's going to happen is exactly what is going to happen. The overall consistency of the Bible, it is, it is unified in every aspect of it. I especially love the fact that only in our Bible can these things happen when we talk about transformed lives. Uh, trade can certainly speak to that, but I love the Bible's indomitable durability. Over the centuries, people have tried to stamp out the Bible. Enemies of the Bible have attacked it to say it will in fact be out. And I love the story. You all have probably heard that about the, uh, the great uh, philosopher, if you will, who was talking about how the Bible would be stamped out. The gentleman who said, in fact, that within a lifetime, within a generation or two of his demise, that the Bible would in fact be non-existent. Well, check this out. The French philosopher Voltaire I'm talking about because he described it as a book of fairy tales that would cease to exist within a generation of two or two of his existence. Well, check it out. After his death, you've heard the story. After his death, his house was purchased by a printing company that published, among other things, the Bible. <laughs> don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor, so don't mess with God. So my message today is for all of us as we go down from this mountain back to our respective homes that we keep in our hearts what we've learned, what we fellowship here about so that we can go and be successful in our individual communities and in our homes, but knowing that we don't do it alone. We do it together. But the encouragement that we should have and always keep in our mind is what God has already done. The message today, the topic is, and I'm using again a sports theme, but it's biblically sound, and that is home field advantage. When you go back to your respective homes, you've got home field advantage. Now, I heard a message preached like this by Pastor Joel Osteen. And I know, Pastor Parr, that many people say in the ministry, if you will, that whatever someone else speaks about, certainly it's open for us to speak on as well too. But I believe in calling to check with that person just to say, hey, look, I like the title of that. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. I wanna tweak this the way the Holy Spirit is leading me, but I want you to know. I think it's the right thing to do. One, it is the right thing to do. Number two, it shows you've done your homework. So I called his mother. Dodie Osteen, I called the boss. I said, look, I'm thinking about doing this. She said, James, take the message and run with it as the Holy Spirit leads you. One, as I said, it's the right thing to do. Two, it shows I've done my homework. And three, if something wrong, I can say, you know, Joel Osteen should have known better than to say that, you know, so I don't have to put that on me. Home field advantage. And it made me think about my wife, Dorothy, who is a voracious reader of the word to absorb it daily, 
early in the morning to guide her. Whenever we travel, my wife has got, she's got all kinds of Bibles. One is probably as big as like, I, I don't know, some thesaurus or a huge book. Man, when she gets on the train and it's not for show, it's not for fashion, she's feasting on the word. And she told me this one time, I'm adding a little yeast to the story, okay? Taking a little license. She's on the plane and she opens up the word and the guy sat down next to her. You probably have heard this story, but it bears repeating because it is reminiscent of my wife. And as she's reading the word, a guy sits down next to her. And about four or five minutes into sitting there before the plane took off, he looked at her and said, ma'am, I, I, I see you're reading the Bible. She said, yes, I am. And he said, um, you, you truly don't believe uh, what's in there, do you? And she said, of course I do, it's the Bible. He said, well, look, tell me something. Now, this guy, uh, what was his name, who was in the belly of the well for three, for three days? She said, Jonah, he said, you truly don't believe that? She said, yes, it's in the Bible. It's a supernatural book. He says, well, can you explain to me how in the world he sustained himself for three days in the belly of the well? My wife stopped to think about it because the Bible didn't get into details. And she said, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah about that. And the guy said, well, suppose he's not there. And she said, well, then you'll have to ask him, you know, so <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to talk to you about heaven is cheering us on as we go back, Jim Blaze, to our respective home territories. Growing up playing basketball and baseball, I can tell much like anybody else, I can tell the same story. We always performed better if we had somebody in the stands cheering us on, encouraging us, and especially if they were family members, mothers and fathers out there cheering you on. Now people can say, you know what, it's, it's probably more psychological, if you will, in terms of what was going on. It, it, but I tell you what, it had a direct physical impact on me because I felt like I could run a little faster, I could jump a little higher, and I had better stamina when my parents were in the stands cheering me on. And that certainly was the case when my mother and father, both who are now in the presence of the Lord, were there cheering me on. I absolutely was thankful that my father was there. My father was like Joseph in the Bible to me, the quiet one, the one I talked much about because my mother wanted to stay home to be an excellent homemaker. And she was and she did. But my father, even though he worked two and three jobs, he never missed a significant occurrence for each of us five kids. He was there. And my mother was always underscoring that our family had a trait of excellence, irrespective of the fact that the world would say we came from modest circumstances. My mother and father were high school graduates, quote unquote, only. My dad drove a taxi cab. He worked as a prison guard. And during the holidays to make a little extra money, he worked out at Avis Rent-A-Car. But I'm telling you, they were PhDs in their drive and determination for the five of us to live a better life. And especially once my mother got a hold of Jesus Christ and probably just the opposite, and to find out that my father had a deathbed conversion right before he went home, thank goodness to say to the Lord that he accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So I am thrilled because that is the most important thing. It's a fact. Let me just support this about home field advantage. And I think we've got something, uh, um, a picture of this to substantiate this. How you have a distinct edge if you have home field advantage. In the 75 years of NFL football, between the years of 1940 and 2015, the home team in the playoffs, research it yourself, had a winning record of 305 and 148. That means they won nearly 70% of the time in the postseason if you had home field advantage. That is absolutely accurate. And you never know what you can accomplish, how far you can go when you've got folks who are cheering you on every step of the way. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, here's the biblical foundation to the thesis or the topic, if you will, of today. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we all know that God shares with us folks who are called the heroes of faith and the amazing things that they accomplished, how they persevered in their faith. 
Great names like Moses and Abraham and David and Sarah and Ruth and Daniel and Esther. People whose names we remember very well. But also, just as Andrew was giving credit to all of the people who have just as important a role for this successful men's conference, all who are making it so easy for us. There are many names we may not remember or know at all, but they are the heroes of faith who God talks about in chapter 11 of the book of heroes. And the common thread, the common characteristic that they all shared is that they dared to believe. They had faith in God that he would do what he said he would do. They believed the promise of God and they did incredible things as a result of that. That's what we ought to keep in mind as we go back down from this mountaintop to do what God has ordained each of us to do. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, and I read as follows, chapter 12, verse 1 in the King James Version. Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This passage refers to our life as a race and it conjures up a picture. I think we have the best picture that we could find, if you will, in our minds of this big stadium in heaven with the stands that are filled with a huge crowd of men and women of faith of old rooting us on as we run our spiritual race, carrying out God's plan for our lives. The best that I could come up with was, a, was an athletic stadium with fans there who are cheering. That's what we can see with our natural eyes, but this is also similar to what it's like in heaven, heaven with the great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on. So we need to see and to understand that we are not running our race alone and that all of heaven is pulling for us as we go forth. No matter what the difficulty or trial or tribulation is that we're dealing with in life, God himself has proof with witnesses up there who are telling us we can do it. We can do it because they have done it. And they're the ones that we need to be keeping in mind. They're up there pulling for us, the great saints of old and our loved ones who've gone on to be with the Lord, who have joined these great cloud of witnesses in the stands up in heaven, cheering us on. Every one of them with every ounce of their soul and spirit are urging us, exhorting us on to success in the Lord. Others who have run the race successfully and have won their witness, their example should stir us on to run with patience and win as well because they're saying to us, keep on running, give it your best, you can do it. No matter what it looks like, God has got our back and urging us on to success. So we need to understand that we truly, in the natural, have home field advantage when we go back home. In this stadium, in the grandstands of heaven, there are, unlike football stadiums around the country, there are no belligerent fans out there who are inebriated, throwing cans at us in a whole nine yards. We got folks who are cheering us on because they've successfully made it and they want us to do it as well. They're totally behind us. They know that we have what it takes in Christ Jesus to get it on. Think about a hero of faith like Moses, who actually resisted God, repeatedly questioned God when God asked him, basically told him to lead his people, God's people, out of bondage, as I talked about yesterday, because Moses felt that he wasn't capable in his own to do that. But that's the point. God wasn't counting on Moses' ability, all he wanted was Moses' availability. And that's what God is asking us, just to give ourselves to him, 
Just as I mentioned in terms of my scripture for the year and for my life, that I may know him. And that's what we need to do. But you can only do that by being quiet first thing in the morning to hear what the Lord is saying to you and trusting in him because he is a God. As he says, and I mentioned yesterday in, in Psalm 32 and 8, when he says to us in his word, and he can't lie, that I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go, that I will guide you with my own eye. He is the God who sees the end from the beginning. So why would we not follow his lead? Think about a hero like David saying, I don't care how big the giants are in your life, in my life, because he was able to defeat Goliath in the power of the Lord so we can do it as well. Esther could well be calling your name saying you might be a little afraid, but go ahead and do it anyway, because all of us have been raised up for such a time as this in God's timing. Gideon saying, no matter how bad the odds look, however intimidating the scenario may be, be strong and of good courage. Joshua 1.8 and 1.9 says that because the Lord, our God, is with us. And the fact of the matter is, we've heard this expression over and over again. God plus us equals a majority. All of the saints of old are pulling for us, giving us that home field advantage. By faith, you and I need to hear the roar of that crowd. By faith. We need to see them in our spiritual eyes, standing up and cheering us on. By faith, we need to know that we are well represented with some awesome faith, represented by those uh, great heroes of faith and our loved ones who are in those stands. We need to see with our spiritual eyes into the spiritual dimension that our brothers and sisters in Christ holding up signs with our name on it, saying, Trey, go for it. You can get it done. Matt, that's my boy. He can get it done. Your wife's name. Yes, she's got what it takes. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep trusting Daddy, Abba Father, because he loves us. And when we know that all of heaven is pulling for us, when we know that that great cloud of witnesses are cheering our names on, it's more than a psychological boost. It has a physical impact on us as well. More importantly, a spiritual aspect in terms of keeping us going. I mentioned that you can go further. I can go further with a second wind in the game of life if we've got some people who are cheering us on. My mother went home to be with the Lord 12 years ago. My mother was an awesome woman of God. She came to faith in Jesus Christ later in life. But my mother, like my mother-in-law, was no nonsense. There was no gray area with her. She wanted to understand what the truth was. And my mother, battling all kinds of physical challenges, diabetes, um, hypertension, uh, you name it, my mother, toes amputated, neuropathy, things were painful to the touch. My mother couldn't walk from her bedroom to the kitchen without taking a 10 minute break, but my mother persevered. And I grew up seeing how my mother struggled for the five of us to provide for us when stockings back in the day cost 25 cents. She took that and fed the five of us to make sure that she was pouring into us by example as well as word. And when she got a hold of Jesus Christ, it was all about him because she knew that he could deliver what he said in his word. So when people talk to me, I let them know unabashedly, I am a mama's boy. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense because I saw how my mother led by example and the fact that my mother wanted to live longer, but God blessed her with a tender 72 years of life. And I always say, if I can be half the man of God, that she was woman of God when she faced death in the last six months of her life, 
couldn't get out of bed, had to be clean and everything. She had the joy of the Lord in her heart. One of her multiple times going to the hospital, Dorothy and I are riding behind the ambulance and we're seeing my mother through the window and she's chewing gum, singing songs like, ain't nothing happening. That's the kind of faith that I want. So I love my mama all day long. Mm. And I hear my mother telling me, it ain't, excuse the grammar, it ain't in worldly things. It ain't in what the world claims is success. God is only going to ask you at the end of the day, not how much money you made, not how much influence you had, not how many people know you. What did you do with my word? Because we know in the Bible, the word says, those things are like wood, stubble, and hay. They will burn up before the Lord. We want things that are representative of precious stones that will stand the test of the fire, doing what God said we're to do. So I'm testifying right now, I'm trying to grow deeper in God's word and everything. Some of you may think that I, or that you, don't have anybody in your family who's cheering you on. Maybe you can't think about somebody in your immediate family, maybe the extended family, but I beg to differ. If you were here today, you're hungry with a God-sized hole in your heart to hear God speak to you, a hole that only God can fulfill. Somebody in your family pray for you down the line. If you stop and think back through it, you'll find somebody in your family who cared for the word of God and who cared for you and prayed for you. That's why you're here now. Just don't go around like most men thinking, I can get it done on my own. That's when you and I will be sifted like wheat because we have to get it done with the word of God. He is the one who created us and not we ourselves. And the reason we love him is because he first loved us. That's the kind of God that we serve. A lot of people are in the race, but somebody has their focus on you. Somebody has their arms up cheering you on saying, that's my grandson or my great grandson or great, great, great grandson. Somebody in your family has prayed for you and they are cheering you on right now. You know, one of the neatest things that I see in the world of sports is whenever a team brings back some of the old stars, the superstars of champions past, that they bring to a home game for the fans to cheer them on, representative of what they did back in the day, individually or collectively as a team to help them to win. And it's amazing because I see a lot of these young athletes, they were run over with big smiles like little kids with their ears wide open, asking these superstars of the past, what did you do to be successful? Can you share something with me that's gonna help me to play more effectively now? That same analogy, if you will, carries over more importantly in the spiritual realm for us. Well, just think, if we had the ability to pull out of the grandstands of heaven just a few of the heroes of faith and visit with them for a few minutes, what kind of advice and encouragement they could give us today? I'm certain it would be awesome, relevant, and timely advice because the word says as much in Romans 15 and four. I love this when it says, for whatsoever things were written afore of before time, they were written for our learning that we may through patience and comfort of the scriptures have hope. God's word is timely. There's no such thing as you heard me say yesterday as new fundamentals. People got itching ears wanting to hear new things. It's what's tried and true. And God's word is just that. Some of you have had some unfair things happen to you. Life hasn't turned out the way that you hope it would be. And you might even have a little bit of bitterness and anger in you, wanting to give up on your dreams. But imagine a young man who steps out of the grandstands of heaven to share his story. And effectively, all he's saying is, don't get discouraged because he tells you, I've been right where you are. You ain't going through nothing I haven't already gone through years ago, if not centuries ago. My name is Joseph. 
I had a great dream. I knew God's hand was upon me, but my brothers mistreated me. They sold me into slavery. And I spent years working for this man, doing my best, but his wife lied on me. And they had me put in prison. It was absolutely unfair. I spent 13 years in prison. I'm mindful of Tony Dungy's story yesterday about the young man who came out and is trying to make amends walking that narrow road with God. 13 years he spent in prison and he says, if I felt like at times God had forsaken me, I didn't see how I could ever accomplish what was in my heart, but I just kept on doing my best, trusting in God no matter what. 23 years after having that dream, God turned the situation around and brought it to pass. If Joseph were standing right here today, his advice quite simply would be, don't give up on the promise of God. Hallelujah. If he put it in your heart, God will bring it to pass. No matter what has happened in your life, just know that God is still on the throne. Joseph is saying, I've seen the faithfulness of God. I've seen him turn it around in my life. I've seen him vindicate me. He brought justice to the situation. And I am a living testimony of God's goodness. Joseph is in the grandstands of heaven saying, if God has done it for me, he can do it for you and me. Then there's a young lady in the stands, love this one, by the name of Rahab. You know the story all too well. She was a prostitute. She says, I'm here to cheer on all the people who've made mistakes. I'm the first to tell you, I did not start off right in life. I had big dreams. But just as Tony made the point about the young man who unfortunately is now deceased, she says, but I got hung up with the wrong crowd. I made some poor choices and ended up doing some things I really didn't like. I wasn't proud of it. I was really embarrassed and ashamed, but I felt trapped like I couldn't get out. But one day I met some folk from out of town, like those who come here from out of town to encourage you with their testimony. I met some folk from out of town and they told me about this God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Well, I did them a favor. I hid them in my house and they ended up sparing my life and my family's life. From that day forward, I was changed. I started off badly, but God did not, did not hold it against me. He not only forgave me, he not only redeemed me, but check this out what he did for Rahab. He put her in the family line of Jesus Christ. Absolutely, because of his mercy, she says, I am now a part of the heritage that brought about the Messiah. If Rahab were standing right here, she would say, you may have gotten off to a bad start, but that's okay. It's not too late to change. You can begin again because our God is a God of another chance and another chance and another chance. As long as you've got breath in your body, God is giving you and me another chance. She says, if you've fallen down, get back up. Here is a, there is a superb future in front of you if you trust God. Think about it. Hear this woman, a prostitute. God had the audacity to take a former prostitute and put her in the family line of Jesus Christ. So what is your excuse? What's my excuse? Today, Rahab is listed in the heroes of faith. Don't tell me we don't have a loving God. Dorothy and I have a friend who for several years has had some challenges. Paul would know better about the prescription for success, but it all starts with God because of the immense business success he is. Things weren't going very well for this friend of ours. Paul, all we could do is to try to tell them, even though it looked like the bottom of their business was falling out, is to get into a good word teaching church. Put your trust in God like your wife called you on the carpet to listen to the word of the Lord and he would turn it around and to be obedient to that word. Well, I see another gentleman stepping out of the grandstands of heaven saying, I know just how you feel. I went through a similar situation in my life as well. The bottom fell out on me. My name is Job. I was tempted to give up, 
My wife even told me to just curse God and die. I felt depressed, but I shook it off, dug my heels in and chose to believe that God again was still on the throne. I said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I'm happy to report, saying Job, that God just didn't bring me out of that difficulty. Gosh, Paul, this is your testimony here, but he brought me out better off than I was before because I came out with twice the cattle, twice the sheep, twice the joy, twice the peace, twice the victory. I got my health back and my business back and my dreams back. Job stands on a balcony in heaven and says to all of us who are in the middle of some tough times, all who have gone through setbacks and suffered loss of any kind, he says here that you will get double for your trouble. God has not brought you this far to leave you now. If Job were here right now, he says the only word of encouragement that I can give you is to remember this, double, double, double. That's the kind of God that we serve. Praise God. Job says he brought double in my life. Some people have lost their joy in life lost their enthusiasm and are just dealing with things, thinking that it's not going to get better, thinking that the circumstances are hopeless and that it's not going to turn around. But the fact of the matter is, praises should always be on our lips because that is what God requires of us. Even in the worst of times, no matter how we feel, we are to thank God at all times, not for the trouble, but in the trouble is what we're supposed to be doing because that's what the word of God says. Well, who is the hero of faith who can give testimony to that? That's exactly what these next two men who stepped out of the grandstands in heaven said. Our names are Paul and Silas. They were thrown in jail after earlier in the day having been beaten with rods unfairly. They weren't given a trial. They didn't hurt anyone, hadn't stolen anything, didn't commit any crime. The only charge against them was that they were spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. But Paul and Silas never complained. They just sat in prison. They were beaten. They were bruised. They were feeling bad. But all of a sudden they began singing praises to God. They had a worship service right there in jail. And we know the praises to God will bring him on the scene. And then all the other prisoners were asking, what is wrong with these two? And that's certainly what the world will ask. Don't think in my profession, I don't have some folk looking at me like, boy, what is wrong with this holy roller? What's wrong with this? I know better. It's just like Andrew said, he's had too much success in the Lord for somebody to come and tell him what won't work in the word. It's too late. It's already happened. That's what we ought to be dealing with as well. And at midnight, we know that the prison doors flew open with the earthquake, the chains fell off and the angel appeared and said, let's get out of here. Even the jailer found them later, bandaged up their wounds and said, tell me about this God that you serve. That is what our lives can be like back in our respective hometowns if we model the love of Christ and whisper praises all day long, no matter what the circumstance is, God will meet you at your level of expectancy if we stand on that. Hallelujah. Let me just, let me wrap this up. I love this one here. I love this one. Another man, because women are always quick to support the Lord, even quicker than most of us men. Another man steps out of the grandstands saying, Paul and Silas, you think you had it bad. Joseph, you think it was unfair. Abraham, you think your promise was impossible. David, you think your giants were big. Well, I've got all of you beat. I was dead. My name. No, be, well, human. My name is Lazarus. Hallelujah. My name is Lazarus. I was in the grave. It was over. Impossible and done. But I had two sisters. And you can think of sisters any way you want in that one. I had two sisters who never gave up. They dared to believe that anything was possible. The stone was rolled away. Jesus spoke life and Lazarus came back from the dead. Lazarus is saying to everyone here who has a situation that looks dead, it's not over, it's not too late. God can resurrect those dead dreams. You may be thinking, 
I'm too old. I've made too many mistakes. I've missed too many good opportunities. But know this, the same God who raised Lazarus is able to bring you and me back to life as well. Things that you may have already given up on, keep in mind, before Jesus went to see Martha and Mary, and they said that Lazarus was sick. Jesus took care of business for another couple of days. And when he went to Bethany, Lazarus had already been dead. How long? Four days. Martha said, Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said unto her, my, your brother and my brother, he shall rise again. Martha says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And you all know what the refrain is. Talk to me, church, what Jesus said in John 11 and 25 and 26. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever leaveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? And the answer is yes. Saints, we are not running this race alone. All the saints of old and our loved ones who've gone on to be with the Lord, they're cheering us on, giving us home field advantage. So let's take our encouragement from them, knowing that the most important asset that they had was the faith to believe and persist. And the truth is, wherever we go, we have home field advantage. I started off talking about how the Bible is a supernatural book. I know I've used the example before, but until I learn something better, I will use this to reinforce the fact that we serve a supernatural God. The world understands it. Why is it only that the name of Jesus, as I talked about yesterday, people recoil at that name. They draw back and try to tell us that we can't use it. Andrew talked about the visit to the local school where Coach Dungy went to speak. And you heard what teachers came up to tell him afterwards because they know we have got to be bold and go back and take back our communities, take back our families and model the word of God because he is the only one that can turn this thing around and we better be bold. But check this out, brothers. We're all together in here. That underscores another biblical truth. All truth is parallel. What's true in the natural is true in the supernatural. It takes teams, whether you're in business, running a Bible college or anything else, to be successful. Ephesians 4, 16 says that every joint supplies God gives the example of the human body being indicative of what the body of Christ is to be like. There are no little fingers or big heads or anything else. We all bring something to the table for the fervent, effectual working of the whole body. That's what we're supposed to be about. So that's what we need to do back in our communities. We can get it done if we walk boldly in the name of Jesus Christ and display all of the promises that he's got for us in that Bible. It is a supernatural book and the world recognizes that. Because why else with the USA Today, however many years ago that they wrote a little editorial in the back of the paper, why would a secular publication say, well, you know what? It just might be that the Israelites could have escaped across the Red Sea because at a certain time during the season, the Red Sea at a certain portion of the season would be down to about three feet high or three inches high. So it's possible we need to know the word completely. How did Jesus answer the questions with everybody? He didn't debate them. He simply said, it is written. So if the US Today, USA Today would say that, that it was possible for them to go by, essentially what they're trying to do is to diminish the supernatural capability of our God by saying, okay, it wasn't as much of a miracle as it should be. Well, what we need to say, no, 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 don't mess with my God. You're diminishing the miracle that he did. It is written that if, in fact, all of God's people went across safely, Pharaoh's guards came back behind them. If they got drowned in three inches or three feet of water, that's a miracle in my book any day. That's the God that we serve. So the point is, let us make sure that daily we are in the word of God. We have got the ability 
through the phones that they provide and technology to listen to those and the ministry that breaks down the word for us to feast on who are committed to that. And what we give to them is going to carry that out to the four corners of the earth because God is not mocked. He will be back at some point in time. So we better be found faithful in executing and supporting those of, of us who are in the ministry, giving the word out. We've come up to the mountaintop to hear from God this weekend. Let's go back down and make sure that we are understood deep into the word, getting progressive revelation so that we can be miracle workers as well. And the fact of the matter is you will have and I will have home field advantage wherever we go because folks are cheering us on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mm.